Alright guys, welcome back to another video. In this video, we're going to be looking at functions, comments, and control flow. So first things first, we'll start off with functions. So a function is the main entry point, or sorry, the main function is the main entry point of a Rust application, just like in our main.rs you see here. So when you first boot up a Rust app project, and you do cargo init or cargo new and then the file name, you'll get this main function here. So this is where all of our logic is going to go through throughout our entire project. So functions are declared using the fn keyword and are named with snake case conventions. So as you can see here with my example, we have fn. This is my function for adding two numbers. So you can start with fn for a function and then the name of our function. In this case, the name of our function is add nums. We're going to be adding two numbers together. So pretty basic. So as you can see, we're using snake case. Snake case is going to be a word, maybe another word. In between will be an underscore. Uh, in some other languages, you'll see something called camel case, which would be the second word in your naming would be, or the first letter of your second word would be uppercase. So that's camel case. But for Rust, we need to use snake case. And you will get compiler errors or a warning if you don't use uh, snake case. So try not to worry about it too much. So the contents of the function is enclosed in curly braces, which act like the scope of the function. So you can see here, we have two curly braces. Inside here is what's going to happen with our function. We're going to add two numbers together. All right, so in our function, we can accept parameters. Parameters are special variables that are inserted into the function to be used or manipulated in some way. As you can see here, we're going to have two parameters of numbers that are going to come in and be added together. And so, like I said before, this is an example of how we declare a function that accepts two parameters. So we have our add numbers function. We're going to get two numbers and we'll return the sum of those two numbers. So when using parameters, the type must be specified so the function knows what type of data to receive. So remember in the last episode, we went over data types. So if you can remember, this is a I32. So it is a signed 32-bit integer. That's what we're going to be expecting from our parameter or from our function call. Parameters can be passed into functions by calling them and then inserting values into that call. So we'll do that right now, actually. So in our main function, we're going to call our add numbers function. So we're going to say add nums and we'll insert two numbers. We'll do four and I don't know, five. As you can see, it filled it in for us. So expecting our num one and it's expecting our num two. Since we gave it that, we're all good. We'll save it and then we will we'll print. So we'll save this to a variable actually. You can save the contents or the return value of a function into a variable. So we'll say let sum equal add nums. As you can see, we're going to be expecting that i32, which we specified here. And then we'll just print out our sum. All right, let's give that a save and let's run it and see what happens. Give it a second to run. There we go. Nine. Perfect. Just what we were expecting. All right. So we've seen one way to return a value from our function, but there is also another way. So instead of just leaving it like this, this will return our nine, but we can also do return with the return keyword and then a semicolon. If we stop and run again, we'll still get nine. So there's two ways to do it. It's really up to you which way you prefer. If you want to do this, that's great. If you want to do it the other way, perfectly fine. And last but not least for functions. So we're going to go over something called scope. So with these curly braces, this is called the scope. So it's going to be the scope of our function here. So if we 
let's make a variable inside just to kind of draw this out for you. So we'll say let x equal six, sure. So inside here, this is the only place where x can live. So if we try to call x here, we'll try to print it right now. We'll save it. We're gonna get this error. Cannot find x in this scope. So this x only lives in this scope between this curly and this curly. And this sum right here lives between this curly and this curly. We can actually call sum and add numbers. And all right, so that's gonna cover scope. So now let's move on to comments. All right, so moving on to comments. So comments are lines of text only visible to the programmer. It will not be picked up by the compiler. So our main use cases for comments. So comment out unused code. So say we have a variable. We'll say three. So say we don't want to get rid of it, but we don't want to use it. What we can do is do two slashes and it's commented out. That's actually how I've been doing all of my notes for these videos right now. So this is not gonna be picked up by the compiler. So if we, we run here and it'll build for a second, you see nothing gets picked up. Sorry, we'll save and try that again. So yeah, you can see nothing gets picked up by the compiler. So it's gonna completely ignore this line of text here. We're not gonna get any problems or terminal bugs. So yeah, that's a comment. So another thing we use comments for are leaving notes for ourselves or for others interacting with our code. So when you're in a professional setting, you share your code with other programmers. You're probably on a team of however many people and you're all working on the same code for that day. So if you push your code to like GitHub, you know, you probably wanna make some comments to your code so others know what you have done or are gonna do. So if we wanna, I don't know, we'll say this variable holds three. I, this is a completely useless and unnecessary comment to make because it's kind of obvious, but this is just, a, just an example. So this is how you do a single line comment. You can also do a multi-line comment. So if I take these away and we'll do a bunch of these, right? It's gonna be a pain in the butt to do this and then this. So what you can do instead is you can do one slash and asterisk and then you complete it by doing the same but in reverse. So asterisk and backslash. As you can see, that's gonna comment out that whole block of code. So you can do a block of code and you can do single line comments. All right, so now we'll take a look at control flow. Mainly we're gonna talk about conditionals and loops. So we'll start off with conditionals. What is even a conditional? So mainly it's gonna be an if, else, or else if statement. And what is this? So an if statement will run a block of code if a statement is true. So as an example, we'll make one right now. So we'll say if, we'll say, we're gonna say four, we'll say if four is greater than two. Now this is obviously a true statement four is greater than two. So that means this block of code, whatever's in here, is gonna run. But if we give something that's false, our block of code in here is not gonna run. So we're looking to see if it's true or not. We could also just purely stick in there a true value. So this will always run because it's always gonna be true. This will never run because it's always gonna be false. So it's looking for a true or a false, a Boolean. All right, so we have our conditional with our four is greater than two. So we know that this is true. So let's try to test it. So we'll print something. This is true. All right, let's save it, run it. 
building for a second. There we go. This is true. So since this statement is true here, this ran. Now let's try to make it false. So we put it back to false. We run it again. As you can see, we got nothing because this statement is false. So that is an if condition. So if something, then something. Or if this, then do this. And so we can compare values like we did here with these comparison operators. Greater than, less than, equal to, or not equal to. So if we change this to not equals, four of it is not equal to. This is true. So if we save and we run, then you can see we'll get our output because this statement is also true. All right, and you can also have multiple if statements. So to do so, we can do an else if. So we can say if this statement, and then we can say else if, we'll say five is greater than four. And to really show this, we'll make this something that's false. So we'll put this back as this. So it is false that four is less than two. So we'll move on to this next one. So else if this statement is true, we'll print, we'll say this one is true. So we should see it skip this one because it's false and then print out this one because this one is true. So we'll run it. This one is true. There we go, perfect. And so let's say both of these are false. Well, what if we want a default case to run? We'll say else, and we'll say print, none are true. We'll save that. So neither of these are true. Let's see if our else will run. None are true. So there we go. That's how you make a default case. You can also just get rid of this else if and hat or oh, sorry. Yeah, get rid of the else if and just have an if else. Or you can just have an if. It's really up to you in your program. All right, so there's our conditionals. All right, so you can also set a variable equal to an if statement. So how would you do that? Let's take a look. So we'll say let condition. We'll say our condition is true. This is a Boolean true. And we'll set or say let number equal to if our condition. So we'll say if our condition is true, we'll return a five. Our number will be five. And we'll say else. If it's not true, we'll make our number zero. We'll save that. And then we'll just print out our number, our output here. We'll save that, run it, and we should, there we go, we'll get five. Perfect, so that's how you set a variable to a conditional statement. All right, so lastly, we'll just take a look at loops. So we'll take a look at just a regular loop here. So a loop can execute a block of code infinitely, unless specified to stop. So what do I mean by that? Let's take a look. So we'll say loop. So this is how you start a loop with the keyword of loop. Our curlies here. Inside we'll just print, we'll print uh, again. All right, so this is a basic loop. So let's take a look, let's run it. As you can see, it's gonna keep going and going and going until I make it stop. So it's gonna keep going infinitely, indefinitely, until I tell it to stop. That's a loop. So what if we wanna break this loop? Because if we just have it keep going and going and going, it's eventually gonna crash. And we may not want that. So to get it to stop, what we do is we'll do a new example. So we'll get rid of this. And we're gonna say, let's counter, we'll make it mutable. 
because we're going to be changing it throughout our loop. We'll set it to zero. We'll say let results equal a loop. Put in our curlies. We'll give it our counter. So plus equals. So plus equals is going to take our counter and add one to it. And then it's going to keep doing that infinitely. So every time it loops around, it's going to add one. Another loop, add one. Another loop, add one. Another loop, add one. So we're going to say plus equals one. And we'll give it a conditional. We'll say if our count, or counter, sorry, is equal to 10. So when this counter hits 10, we want it to stop. And we'll make it, so we'll say break to stop. And we're going to multiply it by 2. Why not? So we can say counter times 2. All right. And then we want to put in a semicolon right here. And there we go. There is a loop with a break in it. And then we'll print out our result. All right. Let's go. We'll run it. And there we go. We can see we have 20. It did exactly what we wanted it to do. All right, so a good example of a while loop is we'll do while, the keyword while, and we'll say, we'll say, number we'll say while number is not equal to zero we'll print that number number here we go and then we will subtract by one every loop so number minus equals one so like up here we did plus equals one and we added one each loop for this one, we're going to subtract one each loop. So minus equals one. We'll do a starter here. So starter, we'll say let number equal to 10. And then we will print. Actually, no, we won't print. We don't need to. OK. So here we go. This should be all good. We have a little problem here. Cannot sign twice. Oh, I forgot to make it mutable. There we go. All right. Whoops. Save and then run. There we go. All right. As you can see, we're counting down from 10 all the way to 1. Perfect. So it stopped because it equaled 0. So when it equals 0, it stopped. So that's a while loop. Let's take a look at our last loop called a for loop. So a for loop is primarily going to be used to iterate through a list of data. So remember in the last video, we got, went over lists. We were two types of lists, tuples and arrays. So we'll focus on an array for now. So we will say, as an example, we're going to make an array called fruit. And we'll make it a reference type. We'll say apples, banana, and we'll say, I don't know, a pear. All right, so we have a array with fruit in it. So if we want to loop through this array and print out all of those fruits inside the array, this is how we'll do it. We'll say for, so the keyword for, and we'll say text. So I'm talking about these three texts here. So for each, for each of these three texts in fruit, so we're going to refer to this fruit here, our array of fruit. So in fruit, we will print. our text 
All right, give it a save, let it run. There we go, we're printing out each of these fruits. So there you go. That is functions, comments, and conditional statements. So I'll see you in the next video for some more Rust.